Well, praise the Lord, another sunny day in Marshan, Manitoba. And we're continuing on our journey of looking at our Discipleship Empowerment Word. Again, I just want to remind you, why? what, what are some of the reasons that we are doing this? Because we believe words, words in the Bible, uh, the words that God uses, can empower us for our discipleship walk. Uh, I, I was uh, shared yesterday that I didn't know a whole lot of other people what, that did this kind of study, but I was informed there's another gentleman that's going, been going on doing word study for year after year after year. And so maybe you can Google and see what he's doing. But uh, there is some others I know that. But when it comes to this area, we're just thankful that we can get into the word and let the word get into us. You know, I was thinking about this a lot this morning as we were kind of talking about this word righteousness, that we can get into the word and let the word get into us. And then we get into prayer and let the prayer get into us. And then I thought, well, I, there's another saying I want to add to that. Get into the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit get into us. Amen. We need the moving of God. And the moving of God, you know, I believe where there is righteousness, where we walk up right before the Lord, God is glorified and God pours his Holy Spirit through us and in us so that we can be vessels for him. Amen. And so as we can... Finishing up the book of Proverbs, as, we, as I've said before, we're going to be a number of days yet as we continue our study on the word right and upright and righteous and righteousness. And we're going to continue to see little gems, little nuggets that are here and there throughout the Bible. And we haven't got in yet, in, in the, even into the New Testament side of things yet, because there is a lot that's talked about it. And as we said, we've been looking at the whole area of the self-righteousness, which we now see is not what God wants us to walk in, or law of righteousness, which the Jesus Christ told us that we could not fulfill, and he did, and which moves us into grace righteousness as where we need to be walking daily. But Proverbs, because it's a, a book of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, helps us to understand the idea of righteousness, but brings us to the place of also getting the understanding that this is a character and nature of God. It's not something that has to be made up in God. It is who God is. That's why his name is one which is the righteous one. So we have this idea of he wants us to be righteous in him, and he pours out his righteousness upon us, so we can walk in his righteousness, that we can follow after his righteousness. So Proverbs gives us this idea of wisdom concerning wisdom, knowledge, and understanding concerning righteousness, because we, we really need to know what righteousness is all about. I know that as I've been studying this word for years, it's again, it's a word that, that sometimes people like, and sometimes people get confused and and uh, don't understand, but it's it's a character also that God wants to have in us. So that when we become a believer in Jesus Christ, that when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, the fruit of that, okay, the fruit of that is that we are walking right, we are walking upright, and we're walking in the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the fruit of being in the Lord and the Lord being in us, amen? And so when we look through and here's Solomon and other uh, proverbs that are spoken about righteousness and a lot of the comparisons between the wicked or the world and the one who walks upright is given to us so that we can have a greater understanding. So we can see the picture of who God is, what God desires to do in this earth and what God desires to do through us. And what he desires to empower us so that we can walk right in him. We can walk upright in him. And we can walk righteously in him, in this old world. And you say, well, is that possible? It's not possible in us, but it is possible in him, in Jesus Christ. And that's why we need to be considering this word, because it's part of the character of God. As I said, part of his nature, part of who he is. And if that's who, who he is, and that's who he's pouring out into us, 
that we would become like him, a new creation made anew from the inside out, then there is going to be fruit of righteousness coming from our lives. Now, that's kind of a tricky thought because sometimes if you say, well, that is true and you don't see the fruit of righteousness, then you would have to ask, well, what's wrong with me? Well, maybe what's wrong is that you need to draw closer to the Word of God. You need to get into prayer. You need to ask the Holy Spirit to fill you so that you can have the fruit of righteousness flowing through you. And I believe that God wants that. I believe he wants it more than anything else because God is a just God. And so his justice is, his, his verdict is for us, <laughs> is that we would walk upright. His desire for us is that we would walk upright before him. Isn't that kind of unique? And so he wants that righteousness in us. But so often we're afraid that if we try to do anything that may look like righteousness or we're working on righteousness, well, then it comes across as self-righteousness or law righteousness. And so then we just put the whole word aside and we don't touch it because we're afraid of those two points, not realizing that we need to realize we can't. We can't fulfill self-righteousness. We can't fulfill law righteousness. And we can't fulfill grace righteousness. But in Christ Jesus, we can fulfill the grace righteousness of our Lord so that it would flow through us. So that people will see the fruit of righteousness as we work or the fruit of righteousness as we teach or the fruit of righteousness as we live on our street with our neighbors. They will see the fruit of righteousness not our righteousness, but the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ flowing through us. And so this is what the wisdom book is trying to get across to us, that if we would just get some wisdom, knowledge, and understanding concerning this whole subject of righteousness and being upright and right before the Lord, we will see many blessings. And not only that, remember we've talked about scriptures where it says not only we will receive blessings, but our children and our children's children up to many generations. When people walk upright before the Lord, it not only affects them personally, but affects your tent or your household, affects those around about you, affects your neighbors. Because what is righteousness all about is walking upright, walking integrity, being an example of Jesus Christ. Because people will know that was probably one of the testimonies that the Lord used in my early years, and I hope he would still year, use, is that when I became a Christian, people began to see there's something different. There's something different than the way I used to live and the way I used to do things. You know, there was a change from the inside out. And that was that beginning of as God saved me and then began to work with me through sanctification to bring me into a place of his righteousness so that I can all walk upright before the Lord. That doesn't mean that the enemy doesn't attack. That doesn't mean that sometimes we will, won't fall down. But it does mean we can walk in his righteousness, in his power, in his authority. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. The reason why we call upon the Holy Spirit, why? To empower us, yes, for the gifts and other things for the ministry of the church, but in, to empower us that our testimony will be a testimony of his righteousness. That we're walking upright. We're, we're allowing the Holy Spirit to guide us and to teach us in the things that are right and to keep us away from the things that are wrong. Do you see that? That's what Proverbs is trying to get across. And that's why when this book of Proverbs, when you see the word wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, that's what it's all about. That's what these Proverbs are. This is the way of the wicked. Now get some knowledge, wisdom, and understanding because this is the way of the righteous. That word but we've seen over and over again, the comparison between the wrong and the right, the wicked and the upright, the wicked and the righteous, the evil, uh, the disobedient, and the righteous. All that is going on in Proverbs. And we need to continue to see that. Well, we're going to start off on our journey uh, today. We're probably going to finish Proverbs today, but we'll see. In Proverbs 28, I want to go back and read verse 1 again, just to 
to set the setting of this a whole idea of righteousness because I, I just love this verse. It says, the wicked flee when no one pursues. The wicked flees when no one pursues. It's interesting. They're always looking over their shoulder and wondering what they're doing wrong because they know, you know, I have discovered in my years of journey that wicked people know what they're doing and they know that what they're doing is wickedness. You know, people who are being disobedient know where they're disobedient. People that are sinning know where they're sinning. Isn't that an amazing thought? Sometimes we think we need to go out there and hammer them over the head. But what we really need to do is show them the way out. To get them out, show them the way uh, of truth and life away from the wickedness, away from disobedience, away from sinfulness. People know where it is, but then how do we get out of it and move away? Well, you put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And then as you put on the righteousness of Christ and you died yourself, Jesus said, then I become the way, I become the truth, and I become the life. And this is how we get to the Father. This is how we get into the heavenly kingdom. So he says, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. You know, we are always talking about how we need to be bold as a lion, how we need to be like a Daniel who is in the lion's den. But you know, have you ever thought that maybe Daniel was bold in the lion's den because he walked upright and righteously before the Lord? Right? Isn't that what it was all about? You know, he wouldn't bow to the king. He wouldn't bow to the different things that that the king, even, even when it came to eating, he wouldn't eat certain foods. Now, that's a strange thought because... His life was a life of uprightness, righteousness before God. Even though he knew there was an edict that they put out that if anyone doesn't bow down before the king and worship him. But three times a day, he would worship God. And because of that, you know, he was afflicted and underwent all kinds of challenges. But he did not worry because he was walking in the uprightness and righteousness of the Lord. That's why he could be bold with the lions and bold as a lion. <laughs> you know what do you mean? And that's what Proverbs, of course, Daniel is already after this book before this book was written before Daniel, but it got me to think about that yesterday. How was Daniel bold? Because he walked upright before the Lord. We go on and in verse two, it says, because of the transgressions of the land, many are its princes, but by a man of understanding and knowledge, right will be prolonged. You know, I think that's, again, sometimes people say to me, well, how, how do we know about all this end times and that? You know, the end times is going to get a lot harder, a lot more challenging. But you know what's going to really happen when the church is taken up, taken out, the wickedness will just pour out upon the land. Because... I believe the righteous helps to prolong or to hold back the gates of hell. Now, you're saying you're going a little deep into this verse, but is it possible that when a man of understanding and knowledge, that when he knows what is right and he walks in that, and, and as a body of believers, we walk in that, we prolong what God, the grace of God, what he wants to do here on this earth. That's why it's so important that we continue to walk upright. He goes on in verse 10. Whoever causes the upright to go astray in an evil way, he himself will fall into his own pit. But the blameless will inherit the good. You know, those who try to get, you know, people to go off in a different way. Even Jesus talked about, you know, the little children. Be careful what you do. With, careful with a childlike believer that we would continue to nurture them in the ways of righteousness, give them a better understanding and knowledge on how they should walk. We should not uh, ask forgiveness for trying to give a strong word to our children or to our grandchildren or to young believers. Now. We need to help them that when it comes to the word of God, this is right and this is wrong. And as they work that through in their life, through the power of the Holy Spirit, they will see the presence of God. Verse 12, when the righteous rejoice, 
there is great glory, but when the wicked arise, men hide themselves. So again, here's that comparison between wicked and the righteousness. When, when the righteous rejoice, there is great glory. Again, I was thinking about that. How, how, how neat it would be is to have a, a morning service where we gather all together and we extol, we lift up, we praise, we honor the righteousness of God, that we glorify him in his righteousness. Wouldn't that be an amazing service? Wouldn't that be something that would be so different? Because what it does, it takes our eyes off ourselves and eyes off the ones that are around about us in the room, and it gets our eyes focused on the righteousness, the character and nature of God, who he is, and how he wants to pour that into our hearts. And because of that, there will be great rejoicing and glory unto the Lord. Isn't that an amazing thought? You know, I wish, I, I mean, we haven't even gone through all the words of righteousness. As I say, we're probably going to be here another 10 more days. Who knows? But I, I was just thinking, boy, there, there needs to be a lot more said about this. There needs to be a lot more written about this whole idea about the character and nature of God's righteousness. Because it's so linked to his justice and it's so freeing that when we know that when we stand before his righteous throne, we have and will be forgiven because we have confessed our sins and invited them into our heart and we put on his righteousness. And there was going to be much glory. Because it's interesting as you go on in verse 13, it doesn't use the word righteous, but he who covers his sin will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes him will have mercy. We have what we have. And I think that's why there's great rejoicing. When you understand, you have the wisdom, knowledge, and understand of this whole idea of righteousness, you will see built in the component of righteousness is God's mercy. And God's mercy and truth is there to build us up, to encourage us, to use us for his glory. Then in verse 28 of 28, he says, When the wicked arise, men hide themselves. But, when they perish, the righteous increase. You know, when they perish or they go away, when the wickedness begins to be pushed back, the righteousness of God will increase. That's why I, I saw in revivals and that, what was happening, the wickedness of the world over in England and that when there's these great revivals in North America, the wickedness of the world was being pushed back and people were beginning to come full uh, full of the righteousness of God and it and the righteousness of God as it was being poured out pushed back the evilness of the prince of this world of Satan that's why righteousness is so important that we walk in righteousness live in righteousness because it not only affects us personally but it pushes back the enemy it causes the enemy to flee do you understand what I'm saying that's why when we need to, you know, to get into righteousness and let righteousness get into us. See, there's a new one we can add to our list. You know, as we say, get into the word of God, let the word of God get into us. Get into prayer and let prayer get into us. Get into the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit get into us. Now we're adding another one. Get into righteousness and let righteousness get into us. You understand what I'm saying? And that's all possible through Jesus Christ. 29.2 says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked man rules, the people groan. So here again, you know, those who are in leadership, those who are, are walking upright before the Lord, the people will rejoice. But those who are doing wicked as leaders in the nation or in our communities, whatever it may be, the people will groan or there will be great sorrow. Groaning is usually comes because of pain and sorrow and anxiety. But those who, when they walk in the righteous, are in authority. When the righteous are walking, how, how do we walk in authority? Think about that again. Here's another little connection of a nugget put together. You know, when the righteous, we walk upright. But notice here what it says. When the righteous walk in authority. When we're when we're when the righteous are in authority, the people are rejoicing. 
And that idea of authority, if you move into the New Testament, Jesus gives all authority and power unto his disciples. And all authority and power comes through the power and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting how, again, a proverb is kind of linking forward into what a truth, that a wisdom, a knowledge, and understanding that if we walk as righteous are in authority, the people will rejoice. Verse 6, but transgression, but transgression in evil men is a snare, but righteousness, righteous will sing and rejoice. So when you get involved in the evil things of this world and the wickedness of the world, what does it say? That you'll be ensnared. Paul talks about and others talked about that when you run a race, run it in such a way that you won't be ensnared or entangled or get tangled up in the things of this world. The world wants to ensnare us. The wickedness of the world wants to ensnare us. It wants to shut us down. It wants to cause us to stumble and not to be able to go forward. So by transgressions, an evil man is ensnared, is snared, but the righteous, but the righteous, as they're walking upright, as they're walking upright in the righteousness of God, what are they doing? They're singing and rejoicing. I don't know if you've ever put that together with righteousness, but can you imagine again, as we talked about our service of gathering together as a body of believers, and we begin to understand the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of the word righteous and right and upright, what begins to bubble up on us is a well of singing and praise and rejoicing. Why? Because all the pressure is off. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. It's no longer I have to take care of everything. He takes care of everything through me. Isn't that a wonderful thought? I don't always get that every day. And that's why I said, you know, when I'm finished teaching this on the word righteousness, sometimes I think we need to go right back and start all over again at Genesis and work our way all the way through because we're just giving a little bit of a taste on the lips and, and a little bit of a taste in our heart. What this, this wonderful gem of a word is all about. We will sing and rejoice. Verse 7, the righteous consider the cause of the poor. Again, here's another connecting word. When you're walking upright and you're walking in the righteousness of God, you will consider, now we use the idea of poor, which is a, a, a poor, but also it's an important word, but that idea of poor is also reminding us of those around us, those who are hurting, those who are needy. You know, there's a lot of needs around us right now. There's a lot of hurting people. A lot of people are, are, are dying and it's sick. You know, I got a phone call last night from Nagaland, from, you know, part of India. And, and the pastor was just about, I, I think, just about in tears. He just didn't know. What the, there's so many people dying every day and so much need. Can you imagine one of the greatest needs that they have in India? Can you think about this? It's not so much food. It's not so much doctors. It's not even money. You know what they need more than anything else? Can you think about this? I'm not trying to put anything down. They need oxygen. I was thinking about that last night. It gets all down to the place that what they need more than anything else is just being able to breathe good air. Wow. But where do you remember the poor? The righteous people, and, and, and I found myself last night just praying for them and saying, Oh God, how can we help them? How can we pray for them? How can we, as that pastor and I joined together last night and the night before, he's been calling almost every night because we, we need to join together as righteous ones to be praying for the poor and for the needy. That's the fruit of righteousness that it, be, it builds within us. A concern for the poor and the needy. That we will not just walk by them. We will not just pretend that they're not there. That we do not see them. But that we, as a righteous, upright person, say, okay, God, what is it that I can do to help the poor and the needing and the hurt hurting around me? He goes on in verse 10. The bloodthirsty hate the blameless. 
but the upright seek his well-being. For the upper, for the righteous seeks the well-being of others. Verse 16 of the same chapter, chapter 28. When the wicked are multiplied and transgression increase, but the righteous will see their fall. When they think they've got it all together, when they, they think of everything that's going to happen, when the wicked, you know, they're multiplying. Are we seeing wickedness multiplying? Are we seeing transgressions increase throughout the world? And the answer to that is, yes, we are. Everywhere. All kinds of terrible things. Just like Romans chapter 1 tells us would be happen on this earth are happening. The book of Revelation are happening. The wickedness are multiplying and the transgressions are increasing. But here's our connecting word. But, the comparison word. But the righteous will see their fall. In the end, we will see their fall. Be why? Because a just God is going to take care of that. Where the wicked thought they've got away with the wickedness and the transgressors have got away with their transgressions, you have not got away from it. All things are recorded. And there is a just day coming when the just God, the righteous one, will sit upon his righteous throne and he will show forth how the righteous will be raised up and the wicked will be judged. Something to think about. Verse 27 of the same chapter. And an unjust man is an abomination to the righteous. So the wicked are abomination to the righteous. But look at it here. It flips it over and says, And he who is upright in the way is an abomination to the wicked. Here, I, when, I, when I read this and I thought about this, I thought, Lord, this is, this is an interesting... Because the wicked are abomination to us. I mean that they're they make you want to throw up. They make you want to just you know just roll over and and give up. But the same thing he, the, the word the proverbs is flipping it around and saying, not only are they uh, the wicked abomination to you, but you need to understand you're an abomination to them. And I get thinking about that. You know, the more we rise up in, in righteousness, the more the wicked is going to want to try to pull us down. Does anyone know what I'm talking about out there? Because that's what's happening. You know, they, you know, when you look around as a believer and see what's going on in the world and the, and the wickedness and the transgressors and all those, you know, it's abomination unto the Lord. You wonder how, the, the, how a just God does not come back and bring judgment right away upon this old earth. But you know, he wants the righteousness of God to continue to throw, show forth through the believers of God. Because as we walk up in righteousness, it's going to affect the wicked. That's why we do what we do. Because we love, just as God loves, to see more people come into the kingdom of God. And we need to walk upright. And yes, some will, will curse you. Some will hate you. I have found that out in the last number of months. You know, things that we're doing, the enemy is just rising up and, and, and saying all kinds of negative things, uh, you know, uh, about them, sometimes about the ministry and about things that one is doing. But you know, that's what it should be, that as we rise up in the righteousness and fullness of the righteous one, we, as believers in Jesus Christ, just like Christ was suffered, just like Christ will, was persecuted, just like the disciples were challenged, we too, as we walk in righteousness, according to this, will be an abomination to the wicked. Now, I don't know if you ever... <laughs> ever thought about that word, but that's a pretty powerful word to be, you know. Can you imagine putting that on your t-shirt and saying, hey, I'm walking around as an abomination to the wicked. <laughs> People would think you lost your mind. But in a sense, when you walk in the righteousness and uprightness and walking right before the Lord Jesus Christ, what is happening in you, the power of the God's righteousness flowing in you is going to have powerful effects on others. Well, our time is already up, but I wanted just to, just to end Proverbs with a thought. 
Okay, we uh, that was the last verse concerning the word righteousness in Proverbs, was Proverbs 29, 27. But as I continued to reflect, I thought, Lord, I, I, I just feel there's one more thing that you want to say to me. And it comes over in Proverbs 31. The word righteous and upright and righteousness is not used, but a synonym is used. And the synonym is this. It comes in 31.10. Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. Do you know the synonym for virtuous is righteous? You know, I believe that when we walk upright and righteous before the Lord, and especially here as the end of Proverbs focuses on the virtuous woman, wouldn't it be nice to change the, the title a little bit and say the righteous woman, the upright woman? This is going to be the fruit that you will have, not only to your family, not only to your husband, but also to your city, your community. Why? Because you've walked upright. And a lot of times on Mother's Day, we preach Proverbs 31 verses 10 through to 31 and talk about this virtuous woman. I was thinking that this year, if I do teach on the whole Mother's Day or on the wonders and beauty of a virtuous woman, I would think, I'm going to shift it just a little bit and say, this is the fruit of a righteous woman of God. Amen. So we've journeyed through Proverbs and we've seen how God wants us to walk uprightly and righteous before the Lord and to remember that is part of his character and his nature, his attribute. That's who he is. That's why on the judgment seat, when we stand before God, he sits on a throne of righteousness. He is righteousness. And because of his righteousness, he will judge justly. And so I encourage you from the wisdom book of Proverbs, let us make a decision today. Not to do it in our strength or our ability, but let us make a decision today that, yes, Lord, we want to walk upright. We want to walk right. Lord, we're desiring to walk righteously before you this day. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to go through and to travel through and journey through the book of Proverbs and see that as you're trying to give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, you're trying to give us that wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of who you are as the righteous one of God. And so, Father, I pray today that in our flesh, it is impossible to walk upright. In our minds, it is impossible to walk upright. But Lord, in our spirit, as you fill us and anoint us, Lord, it is possible to walk righteously before you. And Lord, you show us that as we walk righteously before you, we will rejoice, we will sing, we will give praise. And Father, our lives will touch many around about us. Oh Lord, help us to have a, a powerful fill, filling of your righteousness in us, knowing that, Lord, as we walk in that walk of righteousness through the power of your Holy Spirit, it pushes back the wickedness of this old world. And so, Lord, we ask for your strength, your ability, and your power now to be upon our lives in this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for all you waving, Carmen. Eddie, bless the Lord. You know, I could go on and on. Louise, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of you. We love you. We're glad that we can gather together. Pray for us tonight. Uh, we're going to be up late tonight. And we need your prayer because we're going to be a doing a service, call Wynn and I, starting at 11 o'clock tonight. And we're preaching live in Japan. 
Go figure, okay? That's what technology can do. <laughs> so we're preaching live in Japan tonight at 10 o'clock. And so keep us up in prayer if you think about that, okay? We love you. And Lord willing, we hope to see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.